الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته once again After the completion of the long series about the hereafter we began just a short special uh, um, a course on what can the living offer the dead since we have spoken about the hereafter and paradise and hellfire the barzakh world we have completed a whole journey and we've entered paradise at the end of it and its glorious provision that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given its beauty but we are all still really here in the beginning in reality we are all still here, and that's what we are aiming for. So what can we do for the people who have passed away? And what, how can we benefit ourselves before our end comes? We've discussed a lot about how we can benefit ourselves and build our hereafter. In relation to the dead last week, we spoke about how if a person is ill, or on their way to death, no one knows except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but if they are in a sickness which a person most likely seems to be going on to the next world, and the knowledge is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must begin to remind ourselves and them in a positive way about the hereafter. We mentioned last week that when a person is living and in good health, it is good to remind them of the harshness of the hereafter, of the warnings of the hereafter, along with the positive hope in the hereafter. But when a person is ill or a time of a hardship, out of the mercy of the Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa have taught us to use words of compassion, give words of positiveness to the person who is ill or in a time of hardship. For the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enormous. And we spoke about that a person who dies, their soul, if they are a believer, the soul comes out very easy. Like the spilling of water, as Prophet ﷺ describes, like the spilling of water from a sheepskin, which they used to drink water in those days. So drink, spilling water from a jar. And we remind the dead person or the person who is ill of the remembrance of Allah of certain types of du'as that they can say, asking Allah for forgiveness. We also spoke about the state that a person who is ill feels and we don't really think about when we are in good health. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Hadith al-Qudsi, O oh my servant, remember me at the time of your health and I will be there for you at the time of your sickness. Remember me at the time of your ease and I will remember you at the time of your hardship. Yes. But when Allah remembers us, it doesn't mean that He has forgotten us. It is a metaphor. Allah will be there for you. You can never be there for Allah. Remembering Him means really working for yourself to get closer to Him. And Allah will be there for you. We mentioned last week, Rasul said that Allah says, if Allah loves his servant, there is no, how can we say it? There is nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with more than to take the soul of that believer out. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates to harm the believer and making him ill is a harm to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually bringing this as a mercy. Although in, in the world it, is, it seems like it's a harm. And Allah hates to hurt the mu'min. So imagine what he will do for a person like that once they have passed away. Brothers and sisters in Islam, we mentioned that many people don't know what to do when loved ones are dying. And as we said last week, we get many phone calls. We hear about families who call imams or knowledgeable people in the masjid to come to the hospital 
because they don't know what to do. These families, it's good for them to call the imams or knowledgeable people so they can learn from them. But how good it would it be if they also knew what to do themselves? Did you not know that the dua of, for example, the children of the person who has passed away is closer to acceptance than any other person? The children of the parents? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا مَاتَ ابْنُ آدَمْ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَثِ When the son of Adam dies, all the son of Adam, every child of Adam, their actions are no longer, they are gone. They're cancelled out. Their actions are no longer valid. They can't do anything anymore. Except for three things from which the benefit shall still go back to them and they will be considered as though they are the dead person's actions still happening while they're dead. While they're dead, they're still acting as though they are living. Three things. Sadaqatun jariya. A charity which is still ongoing. So long as it's going on, the person is acting as though they are giving in charity. So it's a charity they've left behind. Or in a secondary stage, if you are the family of the person, you can donate on their behalf. But the reward is split for you and for them. So it is better for us to leave something behind that is ongoing. Invest in it today. Invest for your hereafter. And the second one is A piece of beneficial knowledge that they left behind. Now, anyone can learn something. However, it has to be beneficial. And the most beneficial thing are the things that work for your hereafter. You can even make worldly knowledge beneficial for the hereafter. If it is ongoing, or you taught your son something, or you taught your daughter something, or you taught a friend something, or you taught someone something which Allah is pleased with, and they keep on doing it, and teaching it to others, you will keep on getting royalties for it, if you like, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long as they live, and so long as it is being taught, and so long as people are learning from it. A book, a piece of letter, a word of wisdom, a piece of action that someone learnt off you, anything like that. And the third thing is a righteous child who will supplicate for you. A righteous child who will supplicate. What does that mean? It means that a parent raised that child on righteousness. In the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. You are the one who raised that child. Therefore it is your action. And when you die that action stays. Allah continues. Every time your child supplicates for you. Allah gives you. Every time that child of yours does an act which you have taught them, it's double the reward. It's your child who supplicates for you and the ongoing knowledge that you have taught him or her. What a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So invest, my brothers and sisters, invest in your hereafter. I get questions from sisters sometimes saying, well, all this knowledge that I went through in my university education, what am I going to do with it? I mean, if I'm just going to sit at home and teach my children the deen. Well, I say to you, fathers and mothers, whatever you have learned in this dunya, you can make it in some way work for the hereafter. So long as the intention is for Allah and you choose the thing that can benefit this ummah and move the Muslims ahead. Raise your children. The mother who teaches her child what she has learned in her life Aren't her skills and qualifications best invested in the most beloved creatures to her on earth and they are her children? I mean, how can a person not think about that? Instead of going and making some other person's business grow, maybe a disbeliever's business grow or even a Muslim's business, it's a good thing, but she's making someone else's business grow for, and then gets money out of it, which is okay in Islam. It's fine if, if your husband is okay with it and it's a halal environment, but... If you're going to weigh it out, subhanAllah, there is no comparison. These children that you have raised in this skill and knowledge that you have acquired, you are putting it into them, you. And they'll benefit you when you die. If a person is on their deathbed, what did the Prophet ﷺ advise us to do? The merciful, the compassionate 
Now keep in mind, my brothers and sisters, you are Muslims who believe that you have been created on a journey, a temporary journey. And this journey in this life is a moment of examination. It is a moment of testing, not for Allah, for you. And the hereafter is the abode, either in heaven or hell. This life, we use it for our hereafter. We don't sell our hereafter for this life. When you keep this in mind, and you live in your hereafter while you are on earth, if you know what I mean, then it makes sense that when a person is dying, the best thing you can do for them is to say the following words, La ilaha illallah. Remind them that there is no God worthy of worship except for Allah. Remind them, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Laqinu mawtakum, la ilaha, bila ilaha illallah. Try to make your dead people, or the, the people who are dying, in other words, mawtakum, that the people in, you, you think they are going to die are in a terrible illness. Or you see that they are dying. Try and say the words, La ilaha illallah before their heads, in front of them. Another thing you can say is other words of dhikr, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. The point is, you remind them of Allah. Because that person, my brothers and sisters, is going through something called a ghaybuba or sakarat, sakarat al-mawt. The, the, if you like, intoxications of death. The, um, how can I say it, you know, the unconsciousness of death. You, you go in and out. Rasul Sallallahu calls it sakarat. Sort of like you're drunken. You kind of understand what's going around and at the same time you're in a maze. So the person who is dying comes in and out. Sometimes can understand you, sometimes cannot. These are sakarat. Even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophets, they went through sakarat al-mawt. Except that their hearts always remembered Allah. It's the only difference. Whenever they slept, whenever they were awake, if they are dying, their hearts are still awake. However, their natural body goes into an unconscious state from what you're saying to them too. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was dying, he would grab some water, a sponge, and he would wet his forehead with it. Because he had humma, he had a terrible fever, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he would say, Subhanallah, inna lil mawti la sakarat. Glory be to Allah, how perfect is he? Surely, death does carry intoxications. Not intoxication of, of alcohol, but a different type. He would go unconscious, he would wake up again. Then he'd remember something. He'd say to Aisha, Ya Aisha, I have seven dananirs, seven dinars. What's that? Something like saying today, something like saying a very small amount, something like seven dollars or something. Or eight dollars or whatever, twenty dollars. He says, I have seven dinars, donate it. He would go unconscious and would come back. So, Ya Aisha, did you donate the seven dinars? She would say, Ya Rasulullah, we were busy with your state. He would say, donate them. For what would you think if a prophet of God, his beloved, met him on the day of judgment and he still has seven dinars from the dunya? These are prophets, they're different to us. Donate them. Until finally they did. So, لَقِّنُوا مَوْتَاكُمْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا Remind them of Allah. And Rasul Sallallahu said, مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever's last words are la ilaha illallah, they will enter paradise. Meaning they believe in it. And they say it in truth. And their actions prove it. Not anyone can say it, brothers and sisters. It is those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted. We can only say it before them because we don't know whom Allah has chosen, who Allah hasn't chosen. But even if they don't say the word la ilaha illallah, their matter is to Allah. Their actions decide on what's going to happen. And the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But la ilaha illallah is a promise. The word. Another thing Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to do is to recite Surah ya- from the Quran, but especially Surah Yasin at the time of their death, when they're dying. What Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Sahih Hadith, "Iqra'u ala mautakum Yasin." What does this mean? It means recite Surah Yasin at the time that your person, your, your, whoever, your family, whoever it is, is passing away. Some people misunderstand this hadith. They, un- they understand it as being a person who has died. And then you recite Surat Yasin when they're buried and you go home and you recite it. It's a wrong interpretation of the hadith. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, 
about when they are dying, at the time that they are dying, recite Surah Yasin and recite other verses of the Quran and say the words of Tahleel and Takbir and best of all the, the words of Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah. If you want, you can chant them in front of them if it makes you feel like, you know, gives you the energy. La ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. All these words. Somebody can recite Surah Yasin while All of these remind them and bring them back. For the Quran has a way of curing the heart. And when Rasul Sallallahu said, Mawtakum, your dead ones, he used to say it. These words, Mawtakum, he used to say it at the time when a person is dying. So when he said, Laqinu Mawtakum la ilaha illallah, try to make your dead people say la ilaha illallah, it doesn't mean when they're dead. Because a dead person can't speak anymore. But he still used the word Mawtakum. From this, the scholars understood that what the Prophet is saying here means when they are at the moment of their death. They're dying, they're sick, they're ill. If a person dies, and subhanAllah, a friend of mine, who is also a shaykh, and a friend to me, said to me, subhanAllah, I witnessed my grandfather's death at the hospital, here in Australia. He said the family was around him. And I was sitting there, at his head, meaning close to his head, that's where you should sit, near his ear. He said, when the time of his death came, when he was going, he actually died, he goes, Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, I felt the room had, the feeling, the atmosphere had changed. And he, as though the angel of death was there. So something, something sort of heavy comes upon your heart, in your chest. And I saw his color fade as he died. He said, and everybody in the room felt that. This person dies. And at that point, my brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasul Sallallahu tells us to honor the body as if it is still alive. Honor the body as if it is still alive. There's also a hadith. And there's another hadith which is Sahih. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Kasra al The breaking of the bone of a dead person is equivalent to the sin of breaking it when they're alive. Some people misunderstand this hadith. They think that dead person can still feel what you do to them in this life. Allahu A'lam. But this, I think, is not true. What it means is that harming the dead person, being cruel to the dead person, abusing the dead person, is just like abusing them, harming them, being cruel to them when they're alive. The sin is the same. So the dead body has to be honored and respected as if it was still alive, in every sense of the word, in every sense of the word, whether it is, for example, if it's a female and a male is there, you should not look at places where you shouldn't be looking when she is alive, similarly when she is dead, and vice versa for the woman to the man, unless they are husband and wife, and to a lesser extent father and child, brother and sister, so on. That's exactly how you would treat them alive, is the way you would treat them when they are dead. And this is out of the sanctity and the honor and the respect that Allah gives to the human being. Even to the non-Muslim body, Rasul Sallallahu told us that there is a treatment towards it. Even you have to respect that. For it is, the body belongs to Allah. Once the soul is out, this body belongs to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Except in extreme cases of war where it's isolated matter, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, even then though, there is a sanctity to the body of the enemy. Once a funeral passed of a non-Muslim, and the Prophet ﷺ stood up, he said, it is the death which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to respect. And when they were in a battle, in battle of uh, Uhud, and the non-Muslims, the enemies, did what they did to the Muslim bodies by mutilating them and cutting their parts of their bodies off and mistreating them. A Rasul Sallallahu and some of the companions said, I will do the same to their bodies in the next battle that comes. But then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa forbid him in the Qur'an to do so. We Muslims do not do that. 
If they do that, Allah will punish them and judge them. But a Muslim honors the body. Even if they are the enemy, they do not, they, there are boundaries to how far you go. Our bodies belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are His property. Once the soul is out, the body returns back to its Lord. Allah says, or the Prophet used to say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. And these are the first words that a person should say to the members of the family around the person who has died. Or if you are a family member, these are the first words you should think of. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا which means and we shall surely try you with a little bit of fear in your life a little bit of hunger in your life a little bit of loss of wealth in your life and a little bit of loss of lives in your life a little bit of loss of fruits and luxuries in your life and give good news to those who are patient the ones who at the time of the calamity at the time of the mishap that happened at the time of the trial they are patient and they say the following words to Allah we belong and to him we will return so they accept this thing and the Prophet ﷺ saw once at a funeral at a graveyard an old woman she was at one of the graves and she was crying and saying words like this similar to this why did you leave me my son why did you leave me and not stay why why she was questioning the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ approached her out of his mercy and she didn't know who the Prophet ﷺ was. And he said to her, Be calm and, re and, and remember the reward that Allah has offered for you for patience. And she said, What do you know of my pain? Please leave me. And Rasul ﷺ left her and walked away. Someone came to her and said, did you, did you know that was the Messenger of God? She left the grave immediately and raced to the Prophet ﷺ. And she said to him, Ya Rasulullah, please excuse me, I didn't know it was you. And he said, the reward of patience is at the time of the calamity, not after. At the time of the calamity where the real rewards lie. For time heals everything. So at that moment is the biggest test. There's nothing wrong with crying, weeping. But the haram thing is wailing, pulling hair, saying words of haram banging doors blaming this is haram in Islam crying is normal Rasul Sallallahu buried his son Ibrahim he named him and he was crying in the grave burying him they said Ya Rasulullah you're crying one of those who misunderstood the, the, the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu he said these are the tears of compassion and mercy for we cry for the loss because we're going to miss them that's all it is but we don't say anything except what pleases our Lord. It is a sunnah to close the eyes of the person who has died immediately. Because the eyes usually stay open. Why? The Prophet ﷺ said, When the soul is taken away, the eyesight follows the soul. So never say anything but good. Any some people they may see the eyes open and it can sometimes look a little bit uncomfortable for the people who are looking at it. Our Rasul Sallallahu said, فَلَا تَقُولُوا إِلَّا خَيْرًا Don't ever say any words but good at that time for the eyes following the soul. Everybody will die like that. Even the Prophet Sallallahu died with his eyes following his soul. فَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ يُؤَمِّنُونَ عَلَى مَا تَقُولُونَ For whatever you say at the time of that death, the angels are saying Ameen for any dua you say. This is in Muslim. Sahih Muslim. Whenever a person dies, their, soul, their, their eyesight follows their soul. Say only good words, meaning supplicate for them. Immediately. For the angels will be there, ready 
to say ameen for whatever you say. Allahumma arhamhu. The angels say ameen. Oh Allah, forgive him. Oh, the angels say ameen. Oh Allah, make his soul a pure one. The angels say ameen. This is from the mercy of Allah for the person who has died. It is also a sunnah to cover the dead person, the whole body and the face with a piece of material. Because Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that when the Prophet ﷺ died, he was covered with a beautiful or with a simple piece of garment over him, Bukhari and Muslim. It is also a wajib, a must, that if you can and if you are able to within your capacity, and obviously all of us already have the nature to do so, to be quick and hasten in the burial of your deceased. To be very quickly in it. For the Prophet ﷺ said, لا ينبغي لجيفة مسلم أن تحبس بين ظهراني أهله. It is not befitting to imprison the body of a Muslim to be there in the responsibility of its family still. Why? Al Rasul said this out of compassion. And this hadith is narrated by Abu Dawood that out of mercy to the family. There is a, an, an ease in the heart when a person has died and they're still there. You haven't buried them. Why? Subhanallah, it's this instinct in us. We feel that we want to do something for the dead person. And so long as we still feel that there is something in our power to do for them, we want to do it. We feel unease. And one of the things that we can do, really, we can't bring them back to life, so we give up on that. Some of us cry and wail, and some of us cry and accept but what we can do is still to bury them and give them a good funeral. That's what we still can do. And therefore, the family stays at an, an ease so long as the body hasn't been buried. And you see, subhanAllah, I don't know if you've had members of your family who've passed away, or you know of people, but I have witnessed many times at the masjid, at every funeral, people are very anxious, anxious, anxious. We've got to get the body from the... We've got to get the body from the coroners. We've got to get the body and bury it quickly. Some people are very, very uneasy. They'll be crying. And subhanAllah, as soon as they bury the body and they walk away, khalas, a serenity comes to them. Tears are left, but they give in. And they start to calm down. And slowly, as time passes, the pain goes away. And the memory stays. Also, the body, even of a Muslim, decays. And it is not befitting to leave the body of the Muslim outside because it changes color and the sight doesn't become pleasant. It's just the body. The body goes. It turns back into soil until when Allah brings it back and puts that soul back in there. So it is out of respect as well to hurry up in the burial if you can. If you can. And... Al-Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi used to say, Karamatu al-mayyiti ta'jiluhu. Honoring the dead is to hurry up in their burial. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, it is okay to inform others that someone has died. To tell people that a person has passed away. So in case someone has a debt that's, that they owe to, or someone he has wronged or she has wronged so that he can ask permission for forgiveness from, or any such thing. And also so people can make dua for them and attend their funeral. For the more people that attend to pray, the better for us, the more of us in that congregation, and the better for the person who has passed away. As for those who do it out of uh, fame and popularity, Everyone has to be sad. Moment of silence. Person has died away. And they do it to try and gather many people out of showing off. Then this is haram in Islam. There is no person better than another person except in the sight of Allah. And this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards with. It is very important, brothers and sisters, that among the first things that you should do for the dead person, among the first things on your priority list, is to hurry up with fulfilling the will of the person who has left, be, left their will behind. We mentioned last week, every single one of us must, it's a wajib, everyone must have a will ready, 
written on anything. It doesn't have to be legal with lawyers and courts and everything. If you can do that, good. But what's most important is to have it written. And to have someone delegate someone like your father or your uncle or your, or your, your probably if you have your wife or your husband or two people, your father and your wife or your husband and your father or whoever you want. Your brother, anyone, to carry it out or a trustworthy friend or an imam of the masjid or whatever you like. The point is, make sure that the will is taken care of. So the people should look after the will first and foremost. Secondly, you must hurry up with fulfilling their debts. It's the first thing we should do. Fulfilling their debts. Shouldn't go hurrying up to buy roses and flowers and make their grave look like a palace and start spending thousands of dollars. Wallahi, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Thousands of dollars to build graves that look like palaces. Wallahi, the marble they use on those graves, I think, cost more than all the material they use to build their house. If they built their house. What is this junoon? What is this craze? Look at the companions' graves, if you've ever been to Mecca or Medina. Look at the most honorable beings that lived on earth. Do you even know where the graves of the prophets are? The grave of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah. What, what do they look like? You'd not be able to see them, but if you really were to see them, they're still on the ground. They're low. There's nothing spectacular about them. Go to Al-Baqiyah near, near Medina, near Masjid al-Nabawi, and look at the graves. There are dozens of companions buried there, and we don't even know which one's which. They all look the same. If anything, they, their graves should be built into huge monuments, huge palaces. Now go to the cemetery, the Muslim cemetery today, and see what it has become. This reflects our community. It reflects the ignorance of Islam in our community. Wallahi, it does. Why? Not only is it ignorance, but we have opted to copy the Christians and the Jews step by step, exactly as Prophet ﷺ told us. Even you shall follow them step by step, foot, step by footstep. That's okay. step. Even if they were to enter the hole of a lizard, you will follow them. Do you mean the Jews and the Christians? He said, who else? This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. You will follow their traditions. Sanan, their traditions. And a lot of them are religiously related. And among them is in death and dying. Subhanallah. Forget about weddings. That's, I'm going to talk about that another time. But in death as well. Go there. The only thing that's missing is a cross on the top or the star of David. But we cover the Christians a little bit more in that. Ya ikhwan, wallahi the Christians don't even know what they're doing. Ask them, they don't know their deen. And we are following them in that. Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ never taught them this way. Where is Jesus Christ's grave and, um, if they believe that it is there? They don't even know. Because obviously Isa alayhi salam never died. But even if they had a grave for him, where is it? What does it look like? And then you see their graves. Are, wallahi, I went passing by the graves once. And I see... Uh, uh, a grave of a baby, obviously the baby is inshallah innocent, but the parents have placed an, a statue, an angel, a baby angel with wings on the top. It almost looks like a cross. Look at the Christian graveyards, it looks almost identical. One of them had a beer bottle in there, Ya A beer bottle inside of glass. Favorite footy team. All of that stuff. I mean, memories. But subhanAllah, we have something beyond, much more bigger than that, much bigger. Much bigger than that. It hasn't ended. Death is the beginning of that life in the hereafter. Look back to the series of the hereafter and you'll understand what I'm saying. But to them it's the end for some reason. There's nothing else they can do, so they live in the past. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this is haram. And the Prophet wasallam, he told Ali radiallahu anhu before his death, do not leave any grave that is mushrifan, that is, you know, exposed above the ground, presented above the ground, except that you made it level. The scholars said there's nothing wrong with making the grave about a palm length high, just so that people can know that there's a grave there, but not more than that. Probably a little tombstone, a small one, but nothing extravagant. Even some people who put Surat al-Fatiha, 
or Ayat al-Kursi, they carve it on the tombstone. I tell you, number one, this is not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, this is something we just made up and we think it's good. By carving Ayat al-Kursi on Surah Al-Fatiha. This reminds me of people, yani, ignorant Muslims, who hardly know anything of the Qur'an, probably don't even pray, maybe even skip their fasting in Ramadan, but you will find that in their car they have a copy of the Qur'an. It's never been opened. It's got a zip, very small. If you open it, you can't even read it. They've got it in the car. Why do they have it in the car? They say it protects my car. How can that protect you? If you go to a doctor and you are sick, he gives you tablets, will you hang them in your car and say, I'm going to get cured every time I drive my car with these tablets hung in front of me like that in the, on the mirror? You're not going to get cured. Or hang it around your neck or put it underneath your pillow in the bedroom. Wallahi, you'll never get. Right? Imagine they created tablets that bring people back to life and they went and carved it onto their tombstone. What a loss. We'll never bring someone back to life. And this ayat al-Kursi or this Fatiha, okay, we know they're Muslim, alhamdulillah. But wallah, if you make your grave just very average, the name will tell you, inshallah. If you make the grave average, just by that it'll tell you. We know what is in the hereafter is more than what you have placed over there. Secondly, you have just spent thousands of dollars when you could have donated that money on their behalf. You could have benefited them. What, what benefit would the dead person get with a nice tombstone? They're seven feet under the ground. They don't see it. Only. Who sees it? Only you see it. You're just enjoying what you're seeing. You've done nothing for the dead person. In fact, you're teasing him or her. You're just showing off for the living. What are you doing? You're showing how much you love them? Well, in Islam, Allah tells us how. Make dua for them. Make dua for them. Donate on their behalf. If they haven't done hajj, go and do hajj on their behalf. If they have a nudr, like a, a, an oath they have made, and you know about it, go and carry it out. There are so many ways you can benefit the dead instead of building tombstones and wasting that money. Why don't you go and sponsor an orphan with that money? Wallah, there are parents, I know of people who spent $20,000, and that's just minimum by the way, but just average, to building their tombstone. And then they spend another $20,000 preparing the next tombstone for the next member of the family. Allahu Akbar. You, we could have done so much for you hereafter in that way. A man said, Ya Rasulullah, when is the last hour? He said, don't ask about that question. What have you prepared for it? We are in a moment of preparation. Washing the dead. There is a method of washing the dead person. If you want to know, you can read it, inshallah. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But in general, in Islam, before any Muslim is buried, before any Muslim is buried, they are to be washed in a certain way. And there are rules to washing them. That's how important it is in honoring them. If they are a man, only a man, a male can wash him. If they are a woman, only a woman can wash her. However, there are some exceptions. If the male is under the age of seven years old, then anyone, a male, a male, a male or a female, can wash him. And if the girl is under seven years old, any male or female can wash her as well. And this is in our sunnah. For the man, if he had left a will or said that he wants his wife to wash him, then she can wash him as well. This is because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he bequested his wife Asma bint Amis radiallahu anha or Umais to wash him. And she washed her husband Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So a wife can wash her husband and a husband can wash his wife if they can. If they can bring themselves to do so. Otherwise, the next of kin who is their father or the mother, if they are unable, then obviously responsible members in our community. Unless you have left a will for someone to do it when they have died. A little humorous moment. Back in my father's village I visited in 1991, there was an old woman who loved the imam of the masjid. Like she loved, meaning she admired him, his, his knowledge and his imamship. So she loved him in a, in, a, in a religious way, of course, not in a... A negative way and she said no one will mush my body except Imam so-and-so <laughs> and he's a man 
He has to wash my body. And she wrote in her will and she said to her children, by Allah be upset if you don't get Imam so and so to wash my body. Only he washes it. Thinking that she'll be blessed. If <laughs> now obviously a will like that you're not allowed to carry out. A will that is haram is not allowed. And she died and obviously the Imam said, you know, took care of it by delegating a woman to wash her. But the best people to wash the dead if they are able to are the ones who are closest of kin and the ones who are next after that. The relatives and so on. So the ulama are agreed that the child that's under seven years old can be washed by either a man or a woman. And Al-Hasan, one of the grandson of the Prophet wasallam, he used to see that there was no problem in a woman washing a boy who is no longer breastfeeding and still a child. And this is Abu Shaiba is the one who narrated this narration. You'll find it also in a book called Al-Ijma' if you know these books, but they are written in the books of scholars. There are many other sources insha'Allah. As for the non-believer, non-Muslim, is a Muslim allowed to wash their body? No. In Islam, the non-Muslim is not washed. This particular washing procedure was sent down from Wahi in an inspiration through the angel Jibreel alayhi salam to our Prophet sallallahu to wash the Muslims in this way. This is an honor only for the Muslims who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since a non-Muslim does not believe in this, washing him or her in the name of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is a contradiction. Number one, it is not your right to do so. For the person does not believe in that. And secondly, it is also sanctioned for the Muslims as a special religious procedure. Are we allowed to pray janazah on a non-Muslim? No. For the janazah prayer is specific to the Muslim. There are certain du'as, and there are certain ayat that you recite that coincide with the belief of the person who has died. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تُصَلِّي وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَا تَأَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ Never, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, Never pray on anyone, meaning as in offer the Salat al-Janazah, the specific prayer. Of anyone who does not believe in Allah, from them who has died at all, and do not stand at their grave, meaning doing another procedure which we're going to talk about insha'Allah. Innahum kafaru billah. Allah says the reason is because they rejected Allah. They refused Him. And the matter of the hereafter belongs to Allah. When Allah takes the soul, He's taken it to Him. Therefore, any action that benefits in the hereafter belongs to the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have no right. But if the non-Muslim is still alive, you can make dua for them. You can pray for them, as in make dua for them, supplicate for them, they are living. But for the hereafter, we have no right. For it is the right of Allah. We have no business in the life after death. Ibrahim alayhi salam at first when his father expelled him from his home. When he said, Father, don't worship the statues, they are wrong for you. Ibrahim alayhi salam said, I will ask Allah to forgive you. Meaning, I will keep asking him even for the rest of my life, even when you die. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a wahi to Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is in the Quran. He forbid him from supplicating to his father in such a manner of things of the hereafter after his death. Ibrahim salam said so out of compassion, hoping for his father, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even forbid that for the hereafter is something belonging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And the choice of the, of the person is, brings out the result of what will be after their death. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, you wash the person, private parts, and you empty their stomach out, just giving you a brief introduction. And you wash their head, you wash the right part of the body first, and then the left part of the body first. And it is a sunnah to make wudu for them when they are dead. If they are washing them, they cover the body. The body is, the clothes are removed completely. And a towel is placed on the awrah. 
for the man from the navel to the knee, for the woman also navel to the knee, if, if another woman is washing her. And they are washed in such a way. They are washed in water that is warm, not too cold and not too hot, as if they are living. And then a beautiful fragrance is placed on them, either camphor or jasmine or whatever you want. You place it on them to smell nice. And they are clothed or they are wrapped for the woman, according to some madhabs, four pieces of material. According to others, three pieces of material. For the man it's three or even two. One here and one that covers the whole body that covers, it's about an arm length or, a, or two palm lengths above the head and above the legs. And they are wrapped up. They are placed and they are carried to the janazah prayer. In Islam, we pray the janazah prayer upon the dead people. Salatul janazah is a fard. It's compulsory, but it's com it's the type of fard is fard kifaya, which means a compulsory act that if other members of the Muslim community already carry it out, then it's no longer compulsory upon the rest of you. It becomes just a sunnah if you want to do it. But if no member of the community does it, then each one of us is answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each member of the Muslim community, if they knew. But if they didn't know, you're not answerable for what you don't know. But if you knew, and no member of the Muslim community prayed on the person who is Muslim, then each one of us who knows is accountable. Until members of the community pray on him, two, three, four, doesn't matter. Then the rest of us are okay. And the way we pray the janazah is without any ruku'ah and any sujood. I just recall, subhanAllah, a poem that lingers in my head and really affects the heart. But I wish I can say it too because it's in Arabic, but I'll let you sound something like this. It says, وَحَمَّلُونِ عَلَى الْأَكْتَافِ أَرْبَعَةٌ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَخَالْفِ مَنْ يُشَيِّعُنِ And they carried me on their shoulders, four men. And behind me people making dua. And they placed me in the mihrab. They put me in front of the mihrab. And the imam went behind me. And the people behind him. And he farewelled me, the imam, for the last time. And they prayed upon me a prayer that did not involve any ruku' or any sujood. So maybe Allah will have mercy upon me. This last prayer, my dear brothers and sisters, is a mercy from Allah. You get to supplicate for the person who has died. And I recall a tabi'i, I don't recall his name though, a tabi of the past, of the predecessors of the Salaf Salih, who says, I prayed a janazah and I didn't know what to say. My heart was, you know, after I made the dua, normal dua, I said, Oh Allah, if this man was my visit, my, my guest, I would be generous to him at my house. Oh Allah, he is now your guest and you are the most generous. Be generous to him, my Lord. That night, or the next morning, he says, this story goes like this. The people who were at the janazah raced to this man. And they said to him, Ya Akhana, our brother, what did you supplicate yesterday? He said, I said this and that. He said, because we saw him come to us in our dream. And he, they, he said his salams to you. For it is because of your dua, Allah surely met him with a generosity. Allahu A'lam. However, the supplication of the living is the only thing that benefits the dead. My dear brothers and sisters, I repeat it again. The supplication of the living is the only thing that can benefit. I mean, the supplication of the living benefits the dead. The supplication of the dead cannot benefit the living. And again, the evidence, as we recalled before, if the son of Adam dies, all their actions are cut off, except for three things. And even one of these three things is a righteous child making dua for him or her. Not the other way around. So a person, in other words, it's actually haram to call upon dead people for help, for assistance. You can call upon living people for help because they can. 
Calling upon the dead for help, you know is impossible. It is as though you have put an attribute of Allah into the hands of someone who is impossible to carry out. Any attribute that you put into something impossible and believe that it can help is a form of shirk in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because only Allah can do the impossible. And this is one of the things that some Muslims have fallen into. And the way that shirk began was exactly this way. The people had ancient, great, righteous people who died. And when they died, the people began to remember them in certain rituals. After them, their children came and the shaitan said to them, build some monuments for them. So they built monuments. The next generation they came and said, offer food to these statues on their behalf. So they started offering and so they became gods worshipped. It's in the Quran, Surah Nuh. They were the five righteous men. They actually lived. They were good people. But the people made them, turned them into saints. They supplicated to them at their graves and then they turned them into statues until the time of Quraysh came. At the time the Prophet Muhammad it went all the way to the time of Muhammad and they had these statues. And they still worshipped them along with other new statues. So this is how shirk developed. When a person makes dua in janazah, the janazah prayer is of four takbirs. The first one you say Allahu Akbar behind the imam and you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. You can recite the opening if you want, subhanakallahumma. The second takbir, you recite Al-Ibrahimiyyah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta into the end. On the third takbir, you make the dua. And there are several ways, several du'as that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Or if you don't know them, you can make du'a of your own. It is preferable to be in Arabic. But if you don't know Arabic at all, and you haven't memorized the du'a at all, what do you do? Some scholars said you stay silent. Others said you can supplicate in your language. Because it's not the fard prayer. So you make your du'a. Some of the du'as you can make, Allahumma اغفر لميتنا وشاهدنا وغائبنا ذكرنا وأنثانا اللهم من أحيته منا فأحيا على الإيمان ومن توفيته منا فتوفه على الإيمان Oh Allah forgive for our dead and for the living Oh Allah whoever is living make them live on Iman whoever dies make them die on Iman Oh Allah give him mercy Oh Allah and so on If he is a child then you make dua in the following way Oh Allah make him or her a witness for them on the day of judgment and an intercessor and if it's an, a baby, especially if it was a fetus in the stomach, then it's not fard to do a janazah prayer for them. But if you do, you're allowed. And you make dua for the parents, not for the child. Allahu alam, maybe this is because the child, the pen has lifted up away from them. They're not, they cannot carry sin. Are women allowed to pray salat al janazah? According to the majority of the scholars, yes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. For just as she is allowed to pray the normal salat in jama'ah, she is allowed to pray salat al salat al janazah in jama'ah. But there's one exception. She is not allowed to follow the janazah to the graveyard. This is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows it best, even though we may not understand it fully. But there are some wisdoms behind it. I can mention a few. But the point is, Allah is the one that we should trust. So she cannot follow the janazah to the funeral, to the grave. But there is a difference of opinion among the scholars if the women are allowed to visit the grave afterwards. Allahu alam, the opinion I follow is that she can, based on several hadiths, and also the hadith you heard before when the Prophet ﷺ saw the old woman at the grave of her son. He did not tell her to leave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. If you go on the other opinion, I do not force you and do not impose mine upon yours. But some of the reasons why she can't go there is because generally, generally, women's emotions take over their mind. And second, secondly, women's awra are more than the man. So if she loses herself there and her conscious state is lost, she may cry or wail, her hijab may come off. And there are men there who don't really feel the sorrow as she feels, just friends or whatever. And believe you me, there are some men there who go to look at haram. You know, They wait for that moment. When a woman comes along, everybody's looking at her. And this is haram, wallahi. But as for a believer, a mu'min, al-basar, they look away. But for these reasons, yani, a woman shouldn't be there. 
As for the men, they're going to be carrying him down. Why not the women only? Because the men are the ones that are going to carry him down. Women don't have that strength and the ability. So there is great wisdom in that, inshallah. But the last thing I want to say is, I want to encourage and motivate my brothers and sisters that any moment and opportunity they have for janazah, to do the janazah as much as they can. And I finish with this hadith, Rasul Sallallahu said, whoever goes to a janazah and whoever prays upon it, then he will have a qirat, camel load of rewards. And whoever goes to the burial will have two camel loads of rewards. Mithlu, and he said, camel loads to Allah are the size of two mountains. Big mountains. Big mountains. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته